So welcome everybody. So I will talk about how to bring your application or your workload from bare metal to the cloud. So I'm pretty lucky that at least a couple of people joined. So a couple of seconds, only one guy was here. So I was a bit afraid if nobody will come. <laughs> okay. Um, this will be the agenda of my talk. So I will do a short introduction, um, which in the end means who am I? Um, what's my background uh, of that topic? Um, I will give you uh, really just a couple of words how to dockerize your application, um, how you bring, how you can bring your Docker image into the cloud, which means in my case um, to Kubernetes. Um, um, at the end, um, we will do a short demo. Um, yeah, so you will see how to um, how to start uh, generate all these files and how to bring that in a running Kubernetes cluster. And as always, question and answers. Um, who am I? So my name is Stefan Haas. I'm senior software engineer at Univa Corporation. Uh, this is a small American company. So I'm a former SUSE employee, but this is my meanwhile nine years ago. So I wrote my diploma thesis in the YES team back then. After that, I started to work for Sun, uh, Sun Microsystems later for um, Oracle due to acquisition. So and I was um, part of the development team. Um, for Grid Engine, um, this is our also meanwhile um, the, the main product of my current company. Um, so and the, and the Grid Engine will be the test object for this talk. So we will try to containerize Grid Engine and bring that into the Kubernetes cloud. Um, my current main focus is um, NavOps Command. Um, this is a product, though this is more or less a scheduler and policy management system for Kubernetes. So we are exchanging the stop, uh, stock scheduler of Kubernetes. But that's another topic. Um, first of all, just a small introduction what Univa Grid Engine is, so that you have a bit of an overview what we want to get into the cloud. cloud. So UGE, so the abbreviation, is a batch queuing system. Some of you might remember it as Sun Grid Engine or Oracle Grid Engine, so it's all the same product. So it's a batch queuing system, or if you want a grid computing cluster software, or somebody, some folks call it distributed resource management system, so whatever you want. Um, the main parts um, in this architectural overview are the UGE, uh, the, the grid engine master. Um, the, the master is responsible for all incoming requests by the user, like QSUB, which means submitting a job into your batch system. Um, or if some um, administrator wants to configure it um, via QConf or stuff like that, and also it, everything goes to the, to the master. The master is also responsible for um, scheduling the jobs and for the actual dispatching of the incoming jobs to the execution daemons. And the execution daemon is actually the second part we need to containerize. Um, and the execution daemon is actually responsible for really executing um, your workload and for monitoring the job on your informal times um, um, bare metal machine. So see, as again, these are the two components we want to bring into the cloud. So we will end up with just one image, which, um, which um, includes the master as also the execution daemon. And, but you will see how, um, how at boot up time of this container, it will recognize what it has to start and run at. So first of all, I want to start um, how you can dockerize your application or your workload. So first of all, we do not create containers, we create images. So what's the difference? Um, an image is, yeah, let me say, the standalone and executable package, which includes everything we need to run our application. And the container, on the other hand, so this is the real runtime instance of that image. So usually, by default, if you do not do anything fancy, a uh, container is completely isolated from the host environment by default. If you want to create um, a Docker container or a Docker image, um, you have to, to, to create a manifest or a recipe. Um, in the Docker world, you have to create a Docker file. So a Docker file defines what goes inside your container. So you can, um, access the uh, the, you can set access to resources like network interfaces. 
um, which are usually not available from outside of the container. Um, for example, you map some ports, port 80, if you want to have some, some Nginx instance or something like that. You have also to specify what files um, you want to copy inside your container. So first of all, we, we need to copy our application inside of the container. So let's have a look at a real world example. So if you're talking about grid engine, we want to see that. So in the first line, it's, uh, you, you say what image you will base on. So as this is OpenSUSE conference, and this is a real world example. So we are running that at customers, our grid engine image on OpenSUSE. Um, just as a bit of a background, we choose that first of all, because I'm an OpenSUSE member. And second of that, um, the OpenSUSE image is way smaller than most of the competitors. So the base OpenSUSE image, um, which just includes 42, we are using 42.1, is about 100 meg. If you compare it with um, CentOS or something like that, you are at 150 or even 200 max. So you have to say the maintainer, this is, in this case, I am. So we are running commands. So for running grid engine in that, um, in that container and for later on running workload in that container, which means um, workload in, in the meaning of workload which, which runs as grid engine jobs. Um, I'm installing a couple of additional packages. Um, in this case, we are installing SSSD, um, VI, which is needed for the configuration of, of grid engine. And we also need Java because um, our REST API in grid engine is written in Java. Um, after that, we clean all the um, temporary um, files from Zipper. We define a working directory. So this means um, the, the working, the current working directory, which um, you get when you start up your container. Um, I copy a bunch of files into that working directory. So in this, this is the scheduler configuration for grid engine. These are details which are not that important. We are copying, this one is important. Uh, wrapper script and renaming it to UGE. This will be later on our so-called entry point. The entry point is this um, process or script which gets executed when you start your Docker container and without any additional command. So if you do a Docker run image name, it will start um, this entry. What do you state here as entry point? As soon as this entry point script or application process stops, your container will automatically also stop. Um, you can also, as you have seen here with Zipper, a couple of, uh, I do here also a couple of run commands. So I'm installing here, for example, an additional RPM, which is not available by default in any of the repositories. And here, this is also, this is another interesting thing. I have to expose a couple of ports. So as said, usually um, no port of a container is available from the outside of the container. So I have to expose the ports for my queue master process so that my execution daemons can communicate with the queue master. I have to expose um, this port, which is responsible for the execution daemon. And the last one is the responsible port for my um, UGE REST interface. Go back to the slides. Oh, it started from. So, if you want to generate and test your image, you simply have to do a Docker build dash t. Dash t means um, you you give it a tag and a name, um, and you have to say where where Docker will find your um, your Docker uh, Docker file. After that, you simply can execute the Docker images, um, and you hopefully will find your application, um, something like that, um, with the tag 
if you do not add a tag, it will all automatically do a call it latest with a certain image ID. So I will not show you how to build the Docker image because uh, at least in the case of Grid Engine, it takes about 10 minutes to build all that stuff. It has to grab the complete um, um, OpenSUSE image, which is about 100 meg and install all this additional software. And after that, you can locally execute your container via Docker Run, your app. And again, this will um, just start inside of your container um, the application you, um, you configured as entry point. So, but if you, now we have a Docker image, that's okay, but we want to have a, a cluster of grid engine nodes. And you do not want to, to go to every of your nodes and install the Docker image and start and boot it up um, by, by hand or manually. If you would do so, um, it like that, there is no meaning in doing it uh, in a Docker image. So for that, we are using Kubernetes. So what's Kubernetes? Um, this is an open source system um, held by the CNCF, the Cloud Native um, Foundation Console or something like that, um, originally invented by Google. Um, it's a tool for automating deployment and management of containerized applications. So not only Docker, but I think um, so at least what I, the customers we have, I think at least 95% are running Docker images when it was in Kubernetes and nothing else. Um, Kubernetes follows uh, similar to Grid Engine, um, the master-slave architecture, so the components can be easily divided um, into those who manage the individual nodes. Um, here, the most important part is the so-called kubelet, which is responsible for starting the pods. So, a pod. I will talk, tell you later what this is, but um, to be easy, this is the container itself. And we have the Kubernetes master, which um, includes the stock scheduler and, for example, the etcd um, instance, which is a key pair, a key um, key value pair um, instant, um, server instance for do it, for storing all the configuration of Kubernetes. So, <clears throat> to do a short overview of the namings in Kubernetes, so that you know what I'm talking all about. The first thing, which I just said a couple of seconds ago, is a pod. This is the, the basic block of Kubernetes. So it's more or less the, uh, a process in, on your Kubernetes um, host, um, yeah, node. Um, a pod encapsulates a container um, or more. You can have running as many containers if you want, uh, as you want in a container, uh, in a pod as also resources like um, storage. So we will see that in our example, um, in Grid Engine, we need additional storage for, for our um, daemons. And you can also encapsulate resources like um, network interfaces and stuff like that. Um, the next thing I want to shortly talk about is a controller. So a controller in Kubernetes is easy said, a concept or a manifest how you want to deploy your pods uh, in a cluster. Um, for example, uh, we ch I choose for the execution daemon a replication controller, and the replication controller is responsible. So you say, I have this um, execution daemon, you have, I have a template of a pod, this execution daemon um, wants to have a storage, um, he wants that the, this, this container wants to have the storage mounted to this and that pass, and the controller is responsible for how many of them you want to have, for example, five replicas. And the controller is, is responsible that you always have um, these five um, controllers running in the system, so in case of a replication controller. So if one of the containers, uh, the pods dies, a replication controller will automatically um, start up a new one. If you downscale a replication controller, you do not want to have five anymore, you, you are okay with three, it will automatically kill two of them. Um, the last thing I, wanna, I want to shortly introduce is the service. Um, pods in the Kubernetes world, they call it, they are ephemeral or mortal. This means they are born and when they die, they do not get resurrected or stuff like that. So while each pod gets, it, gets its own IP address, um, even those IP addresses cannot be, um, you cannot rely on those IP addresses 
to be stable over time. So a Kubernetes service is more or less an abstraction, um, which defines a logical set of pods. You can have more pods um, in a, in a, as a service, and a policy by which um, to access these, um, these pods. So let's think on a uh, multi-tier replication. So you have a web server, database, and you do not want to, to access a real instance, um, a real pod on your Kubernetes cluster, so you want to access the service for, for all that stuff. So when it comes to bringing your Docker image to Kubernetes, first of all, we have to decide what controller fits best for your application. So here's another example, um, a daemon set. So with a daemon set, you can ensure that every node in the cluster runs an instance of your pod. Um, and we, you have to prepare storage for your application. So we need to do that. So a storage in Kubernetes can be NFS, CephFS, Amazon EBS, and can be an Azure Drive or something in the Google Cloud, wherever you want. And it also can be um, a so-called host pass, which simply means a local pass or a local directory on your node, which is only for um, reasonable for, for demoing purposes. So again, real world example. First of all, I want to show you my demo environment. Unfortunately, the demo gods haven't been with me, so I destroyed yesterday in the evening my CAS installation. So I have to fall back to Minikube. Um, Minikube is a virtual machine which um, runs Kubernetes inside. So that's also the reason why I'm, not, I'm now relying on a local gear, a host pass. Usually I'm showing that stuff with an, an, an NFS server running as a pod. Okay, nevertheless. Um, first of all, we have to create a PV, so a persistent volume. This is a storage provisioned by the administrator. And again, this can be NFS, whatever you want. Um, the administrator has to say, okay, I have here an NFS share. This is mounted on this server. Or you can, you can um, have access to the, via this NFS server, and there are 30 gigs of memory. Um, we need a PVC. This is the persistent volume claim. This is uh, the request for storage by a user. So a user usually does not care where his um, storage is. So a user does not want to know if this is on Amazon, if this is on Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, if this is somewhere in the Google Cloud. He doesn't care. The only thing he wants to, um, he says, okay, I need here five gigs, stuff like that. Um, for the UG execution daemon, um, I choose a replication controller um, just for demoing purposes. Um, usually you, you would say for a execution daemon you would uh, choose a daemon set, which means that you have one execution daemon per node in your Kubernetes cluster. But in a Minikube environment, this doesn't make many sense. Um, for the UTQ master, I choose um, a stateful set. A uh, stateful set is pretty similar to a replication controller with the difference that a stateful set provides a unique identity to your pod. This means um, the first one will get called UGQMaster O, the second one dash one, dash two, and so on and so on. Instead of um, if you do a replication controller, you get UG execution daemon dash some arbitrary um, numbers and, and um, letters. Um, another good um, thing about the stateful set is that it provides a guarantee about the ordering um, of scaling and deleting. So as said, you, you can count on the numbers and if you downscale or uh, your stateful set, you can, uh, you, you can get sure that the last one will get killed first. You cannot get, you're not sure in case of a replication controller. And last but not least, we need a service. So in this case, uh, we need a headless service as we have only one um, queue master running. And this headless service is tied to this stateful set, which means we get a DNS entry um, directly for this UG queue master um, um, part. So we, have, we can connect from the outside to our Univa grid engine cluster. So we can do a QSAP or QCONF even from outside of, a Q, of Kubernetes if you want. Okay, let's go back to the examples. And
Um, let's start with the persistent volume. Again, this is what you as administrator has to create. So you have to, to, to create or prepare some storage that um, the, your pods or controllers or whatever can rely on. So this is a pretty, pretty simple example. You can get that as sophisticated as you want. So first of all, I say, uh, so, uh, so let's, you, can, you can do your configuration in, in Kubernetes um, either via JSON files or YAML. So uh, in my opinion, a YAML file is more easy to read, so I choose that for the demonstration. So the first line says, okay, this is all about a persistent volume. Uh, in Kubernetes, you, also, you always have to say which API version this persistent volume belongs to. Um, you, um, you have to give it a name for sure. And in Kubernetes, you can add labels. These are just simple um, key value pairs where you can do sort and ordering later on. So the, um, there is nothing special about that in Kubernetes itself. It's just for uh, monitoring and, and stuff like that. Um, so I, I said, okay, this is the type um, local. Um, you have to specify what, uh, what kind of persistent volume this is. So I give it a capacity of 10 gig of memory. Um, you have to, to specify the access mode. This, in this case, I said read, write many. This means that on many nodes, you, from many nodes, many different nodes, you can read and write at the same time to this um, persistent volume. And I have to say what kind of persistent volume this is. So in this case, it's a host pass, um, which means it's a local directory on the node the persistent volume gets created on. So if you would have an NFS server, it, you would have to say here NFS. Um, here you have, would have something like a server entry and stuff like that. Um, this is the persistent volume claim, so this is um, the thing the user will create, so user will rely on. So again, I said it's a, a persistent volume claim, the kind, um, the name is UGE claim. I have the same access mode and I want to get three, so I need for my, um, my workload, my application, my pod, I need to have three gig of available. So this is my request. This would be all about the storage. So let's dive into the controllers. This is the replication controller responsible for the execution daemon. Um, again, you have to give it a name. You have to say what it is at all. Um, this is the, speci the specification for the replication controller. So when creating that replication controller, it will boot up no pod so far. So you could also say, I, I want to have it boot up 10 or something like that. Um, then you have to specify what container you want to run inside this pod or containers. Again, you can have multiple containers running in this, uh, inside that. So in this case, we have only one container running inside. Um, I named that container execution daemon. You have to say where um, Kubernetes can download um, this image. In my case, I have it uh, lying um, on the Google Cloud. Um, you have to, you can um, additionally add a so-called pull policy. So in my case, it says um, if, it's, if it's not present on, on the node you want to, to boot up or to start this part, please go to this direction and download it. You also can say something like always. Um, in this case, it will always go to this um, to this pass and uh, look up if there is a new version of your um, of your application. Um, you can down pass environment variables directly inside of your container. So in my case, I uh, I have a couple ones. So this one is the the first one, the UGH type, this says what, um, inside, what the container should start inside. So in this case, it should start an execution daemon. Um, this is just for demoing purposes. So if this wouldn't be O, so the UG, UG deletion timer, the, this would cause the pod to destroy itself if, for example, you have, don't have for 10 seconds workload on your 
um, execution daemon running. And I want to, to know inside the container in which namespace I'm running. So in, uh, in Kubernetes, you can have different namespaces, which is a pretty um, basic and simple way to, um, to divide your, or your, to cluster your, your Kubernetes cluster, or divide your, clus your Kubernetes cluster in different sections. For example, you have um, um, some development, you want to have a, a development um, um, namespace, and you have additionally some for the production. You can also add um, lifecycle hooks. So in this example, I added a pre-stop hook, which means um, as soon as before the pod actually gets stopped or killed by Kubernetes, it should execute that command. So this command will only um, go to the queue master and say, okay, I will be not available in a couple of seconds anymore. And again, like in, um, like in Docker, you have to, um, to say which ports should be accessible from outside of, of Grid Engine. Uh, sorry, for, of, of Kubernetes. Um, the, the last um, couple of lines here says, okay, I want to have, uh, I, I want to mount a pass inside of my, um, of my, of my container, and this container, uh, this pass should be from the persistent volume claim uh, we, we just created. This is this so-called UGE claim. So this one should be available um, at all my later at all my part uh, execution demon parts. So this is the stateful set for queue master. It's pretty the same except that it's a stateful set and I want to boot up one replica at a time. Um, yeah, and uh, there are a couple of environment variables missing which are not unnecessary for the queue master. But again, I want to have um, a shared directory between the execution daemon and the queue master. So you can see here, this is the same persistent volume claim. Both of them are available. Uh, so this claim will be, should be available in my queue master rep, um, parts as also in my execution daemon parts. Well, this takes a while. I have to boot up my Minikube cluster, which is just should take a couple of seconds. So I created a, a script which will um, add all these YAML files to to my Kubernetes cluster, um, because they, we have here um, four different uh, five. We have the service also. Um, and it's always the same. You do a cube control, create dash f and this YAML file. So we do not have to um, look at that. So, okay, Minikube is up and running. So there are no pods running so far. So let's create um, our UGE cluster. So as you can see here, the first what I did, um, I created this um, persistent volume. After that, I was able to create my persistent volume claim, started up my UG queue master. Uh, so my, I created my stateful set for the queue master and I created the replication controller. So usually, now we should have one queue master replica running but no execution daemon. Yeah, so we have one queue master running here, one of one. So let's add a couple of execution demons.
Okay, so it says um, I scaled my stuff. Now you can see that we have three execution demons up and running, and now we can go inside of the queue master just to uh, demonstrate that they are really up and running and that we are really have a running grid engine cluster. So for those who are familiar, for um, maybe this grid engine, so you can see here, I'm on my queue master host and I have here three different execution demons running inside which are exactly the pods we just booted up here in my mini cube environment. So that's what I wanted to show you. Are there any questions? Don't see anybody. Okay, thank you.